Hey, everybody, welcome back to another episode of Brilliantly Resilient Live. I'm Kristen Smedley here with my buddy, Mary Fran Bontempo, and we are bringing you a supercharged, exciting guest today. And I have to tell you, when I came across Fitz, I was like, you just have to come on our show because we need to know you. First of all, all the pictures that she has online, it's high energy, exciting. I'm like, oh my gosh, this is what we need to continue our journey of helping you all have your most brilliant year yet. And then I saw the title of her book and I'm like, well, now we're gonna stalk you till you come on. You guys, it's called My Noisy Cancer Comeback. Noisy, I was like, who fits in well here when they we have- We love to, noisy. noisy Fitz Kohler, thanks so much for joining us today. Uh, thanks, ladies. I'm super excited to talk to you. And it's rare that I find somebody who has similar energy as I do. So <laughs> I feel like I'm in good company. <laughs> yes, we do excellent. our best. We do our best to, to, to amp it up. Mm -hmm. so we're going to dive into your journey a little bit, but I wanted to make sure that we get this out there because I did not tell Mary Fran this beforehand. I was looking at the many reviews of your book. There were so many when I Googled it. And the one, um, one of the fitness companies had said that, you know, so many people in the industry, and we'll talk about what it is that you do. We're going to love this book for all of the information that you have. But it also said for those that never considered ever running a race, it may yeah. motivate them to do that. And I was like, oh, Mary Fran has to read this. Let's do the Hi. Mary Fran challenge. <laughs> well, you know what, Mary Fran, if you're going to run a race, it certainly should be one of my races. So well, I, it would I, have to be. Well, I wouldn't do any other one at this point. Thank Why you not? very much. Yeah, I bounce all over the country. So there's a good chance I will come to a location near you. And I can't wait to welcome you through a finish line. Yes. <laughs> I will be there with cowbells and everything because I'll be at the finish line an hour and a half before Mary Fran, but I will cheer you <laughs> on. I will cheer you on. <laughs> so it'll either be it'll either be the apocalypse when that happens or angels will sing. One of the two. We'll just I'm, I'm rooting for the angels. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> we'll see. All right. I had to get that out there. So now let's 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 dive in a little bit here to we we gave you know the spoiler alert of what you're doing now. Your spoiler you're alert is I survived. So yeah. <laughs> That's yeah, there you go. So let's let's start at the at the beginning. I mean, obviously the book is called My My Cancer Comeback. My noisy cancer comeback. The noisy cancer comeback. And we're we're giving a little hints here about you with, with races and all. So let's talk about, let's unpack that a little bit. Let's talk about your involvement with races and then what happened. Sure. So um, professionally, I'm a fitness expert, sports performance expert, and that kind of led me down a path where I am now a professional race announcer as well. And so I host some of the largest, most prestigious running events in the entire United States, LA Marathon, Big Sur, Buffalo, Philadelphia Marathons. I announced the DC Wonder Woman and Batman Run series. So I literally hit all four, four corners of the country every year and a whole bunch of awesome places in between. And I man the start and finish lines of each event. So as runners show up in the morning, usually at the crack of dawn, mm -hmm. they're greeted with super fun music and my big voice telling them, I'm happy you're here. And I'm there to engage the athletes inform them about the course they're about to conquer, any information they need to know. I plug sponsors and then I entertain. And really what I like to compare it to is even at Los Angeles where they give me 27,000 athletes on uh, race day. I feel like we're all just sitting at the kitchen table together. You know, I love to have a conversation with my people and make them feel like I'm talking to them because I am, I never talk at anybody. And, you know, I, I just want to make sure if you're new, you feel supported, welcome, part of a team, you feel comfortable, and I, I help you resolve, your, resolve yourself of those nerves. And if you want to win the race or win your age group or just beat your personal record, I also want to amp you up so you can do that. And so, you know, at the start line, I get everybody organized, gathered, entertained, and then I whip them into a frenzy and yell, go as big as I can. <laughs> and then they leave and then I'm sad because we were having so much fun and then I move over to a stage at the finish line and at that point I'm able to welcome almost all of our athletes by name and make sure each one feels like they won the race including our final finisher because I'm in love with the back of the pack and while it's very respectable to be one of the speedsters up in front boy my heart 
just bursts with joy when I see the back of the Packers coming, the people that are gritty, the people that nobody would have expected should have ever even considered showing up at a race. Uh, I love those people. And when I say runners, I'm also including walkers. I want everybody to know that when we have a 5K, 10K half, full marathon, there is no requirement to walk. There's no, oh, I'm sorry, no requirement to run, no requirement to bend your knees high, propel yourself off the ground. You just go the distance and we will make sure you feel congratulated for it. I love this so much. I love it so much because I always said I wasn't a runner. I was a lifelong soccer player in all the sports and I didn't want to run unless I was chasing a ball or being chased by, right. by right. somebody, right? However, I got into a 5K a couple of years ago, just I think it was a friend and we were supporting somebody or a fundraiser. And then when I experienced the energy of that race and mm -hmm. somebody there pumping everybody up and then doing it together with friends. I thought, you know what? I think I was, a, was not into running because it seemed individual to me and I love team sports. But when a race is done well, the way that you're talking about in that format, you are a part of a team and I got addicted but then I will say there have been races I've gone to like for fundraisers and all the way. They don't do all of that. And I no. feel like it's this individual, oh. Yeah, you know, <laughs> <laughs> traditionally the races that bring me in, I mean, I, I could speak highly, you know, give the 10 stars to all of my events and a telltale sign that they're really invested in their athletes is the fact that they're willing to invest in me. You know, local races yeah. normally have some dude there with a bullhorn and he's like, all right, guys, you're going to go there, come back, honk, get out of here. <laughs> you know, so a race that invests in entertainment and engagement and, and a personality who actually understands the running community, you know, on occasion it's a DJ or some like weatherman who didn't, uh, who, who was uh, not afraid to get on a microphone and do the job. But I think it really matters the fact that I'm a runner. You know, the fact that yeah. I participate, I hit the wall, I have hip and knee pain. I know what it's like to be out there and think, oh my gosh, what am I doing? <laughs> and then I also know the victory of that finish line. And um, yeah, it's, it's a wonderful community. And I tell you what, the running community, not only do I love being a part of them, but I be truly believe they were part of my cure last year. Just the most spectacular group of millions of people. Wow. So let's, let's just dive right into that because you're, yeah. you're singing our song here with the tribe. And I just got all the feels as I saw the look on your face, you know, really uh, touched by, by the support of your tribe. So let's talk about that a little bit. Yeah. So uh, I'm, you know, I'm the girl least likely to be diagnosed with anything horrible as a fitness expert. I do most of the right things. I'm never perfect in any category of anything. Um, but I walked the walk for sure. And so in December of 2018, I was, I went in for my clean mammogram and uh, was very happy. I went in for the mammogram, came out clean, was thrilled. Less than seven weeks later at a hotel bathroom on a race weekend, I rubbed my under boob. I was standing naked in the hotel bathroom and I put my hand under to scratch an itch and I went, uh-oh. And I felt it. It felt like a, like a bean, like a black bean, little thing. And I thought, Mm. I've got breast cancer, you know, it just, and I'm, I'm the ultimate optimist. I've never someone who would just think the worst, but I knew it. And so here's the pivot point is my cell phone was on my, on the counter in the bathroom. I picked it up immediately within 30 seconds. I had my doctor's office on the phone and I said, Hey, I found a lump and we were making those appointments. I did not hem and haw. I did not call my mom and cry. I did not Google it. I picked up the phone and I saved my own life. And so you know, from that point, it went to the doctor appointment a few days later, mammogram a few days later, biopsy, diagnosis. And within three weeks of finding that lump, I started chemo and, you know, my wow. life was thrown into spin cycle. It's yeah, tough. I would say that's a good, that's a good uh, analogy, spin cycle. Yeah. Wow. So, so what is it about you that makes you just pick up the phone and go for the, the answer and not do what you said? Let me just sit here and sulk for a minute. Um, well, I'm a woman of action and I control the things I can. And uh, I have never, ever found sticking your head in the sand, playing an ostrich to benefit anybody, period, end of story. You know, I know where I screw up and man, facing that girl in the mirror every day, she's my toughest competition. And so, yeah, I just, I got it. I preach it my entire career. I've been preaching annual exams of all sorts and early detection. And that was my moment. Um, I certainly wasn't going to cower away from it. And here's the other thing I want to live. And I hear so many horror stories of people who, you know, basically um, assisted in their own demise because they refused to take action on their own behalf. And that's simply unacceptable. So, so yeah, I made that call and I'm 
damn proud of it. And I will continue telling that story for the rest of my life because I hope it uh, encourages other people to do the same. I love we, um, we talk about, uh, I, I certainly had the experience. My son um, w- was uh, addicted to, to heroin for many years Yikes. and alcoholism and all that kind of stuff. And one of the things that I say is that very often when hit with crisis or challenges like that, we are two closest companions and I never call them friends, right. are distraction and denial. Uh-huh. So, you know, we have that idea of, well, if I don't think about this, it'll go away. And it never. doesn't. Mm-mm. So that idea of stepping up immediately and yeah. picking up the phone and making the call. And that's one of the things that Kristen and I talk about with this whole reset thing, which is, you know, you get hit with this sucker punch, but what are the controllables? Yeah. The control, you don't have control, but action in terms of reaching yeah. out to someone else who can help you. So that is huge in this yeah. reset, you know, this reset part of it and everything else you talked about, you know, with this, with the perspective of your personal perspective of being a person of, of action and of health and recognizing that those were your strengths. So you two have not read my book yet, correct? Right. Not I yet. tell you what, one of the main themes of the book, and I'm gonna hold it up here. Like this, Go hold it up. It Show it. Oh my God, look at it. <laughs> and the subtitle running at the mouth while running for my life. But, um, <laughs> But yeah, I talk a lot about perspective and here's the deal. I, uh, I'm a joy addict. I prefer to be happy. On occasion, we, we stumble across friends on social media, for example, and the, the greatest example they want to set for themselves is look how weak I am. I fell down. Look at the scratch on my knee. Look at these obstacles. It's, it's a pity party. It's a sob story. And that's, that's what they want to project. And that's, um, for me, not acceptable. I mean, everybody gets to do their own thing, but for me, I am most drawn to strength and resiliency and joy. And so this book is really about those choices that I made. Now, to be clear, I had uh, 21 rounds of chemo. The first six were considered the most toxic combination of chemo they give to anyone at any time. Um, I also had 33 rounds of radiation. I had several surgeries and those first six rounds of chemo spaced three weeks apart. So it lasted about five months. I was brutalized. I was dragged behind a horse. I was so sick. Every single thing that could go wrong went wrong. However, I never once had a pity party. Not once did I ask why me. And uh, the reason being is I have the gift of perspective. You know, I was able to say, even when I was terrified and thought I was going to die, and and I'm not saying I didn't cry every day because I cried every day and I cried in my bathroom alone and I cried in my car alone. And it was just the the stress was so unbearable. It's, It's impossible to describe. But I would tell myself, I'm not a kid with cancer which as you can imagine, being a two-year-old with any sort of cancer, it's gotta be way harder and confusing than an adult. It wasn't my kid with cancer. And last but not least, it wasn't one of the more typically lethal types of cancer, lucky for me. And so even though things were hard, miserably hard, and there was so much pain and suffering, I never once had that pity party uh, because I felt fortunate to be in the position I was in. And you know what? Uh, one of my girlfriends, she died 50 years young. She was super fit, died of an aneurysm, just dropped dead on her office floor early December. Mm-hmm. She didn't have a fighting chance. And so for the most part, whatever situation you're in right now, there's a fighting chance and you got to appreciate that. The book is a lot about perspective, about how my passions really lifted me up. And, um, you know, I chose to be positive. There were days where I could have had you know, a boohoo, miserable fest. I could have complained to everybody on the planet and they all would have understood. And that just wasn't my choice. You know, I chose to smile when I could laugh when somebody said something funny. And that really, you know, this book, even though some people say they cry at points and it's cancer. So there's, uh, I get raw, but there's a lot of laughter here. This could have been called adventures in breast cancer or something like that. I mean, attitude is everything. Yeah. You know, you, you just said you have the gift of perspective and I, I want to yeah. share this real briefly. My, I don't know if you know my story, but my two, two of my three kids were born blind. Oh. And my oldest is now I'm actually going up to his campus this weekend to celebrate his 21st birthday. Wow. He's loving life, but he has, I mean, I was, I call myself the relentless optimist. He's way more optimistic than I am. And when you look at the statistics in the blind community with 70% unemployment rate. It's all this stuff. Everyone is pretty much for the most part having a pity party over yeah. blindness, but Michael wasn't born that way. 
I was having a pity party for three years and realized one day, I always say that it was the change in, the miracle change in perception for me because Michael was living life that he said to me, my miracle moment was mommy, isn't this the best day ever? And it was a typical day in his life. And he just woke up every morning. That's the best day ever. And he has out achieved every single person in his age bracket. He's in the top 1% of, of 75,000 students. Like I was just going to say, he's probably out achieving the seeing kids too. Yes. Yeah. He out achieves everybody and he takes on a bunch of things and he has a lot of success and failures and he bounces back. But I've never realized, I mean, I always say that he changed my perception of blindness and that's how I was able to move forward and the trajectory of our lives went up. But I didn't realize that what a gift and a blessing that he was born with the gift of perspective and and optimism for real. Uh, So yeah, yeah. And I do believe it's a gift, but it's also a choice. It's also a choice to remind yourself it could be worse. It could be worse. It could be worse. And again, I had stages where, I mean, my, uh, my fingernails were ripping off. They were rotting off on my hands. There was every single millimeter of my body was being uh, destroyed by the chemo. And I would still find the reason why it was a good day or I was in a better situation than someone who was, you know, boom, instantly paralyzed for life, you know? So we always have choice choices. You know, I didn't choose cancer, but I chose almost everything else. And if I had not uh, been successful in my bat- battle against cancer, I would have chose my way out. I would have chose who would be surrounding me in that room? You know, I visualized it. It wasn't, it was, it was hard, but I knew what song would be playing. I know what song will play on my funeral one day. I know that, um, you know, I will have a celebration of life. You know, there's, there's decisions we have, there's choices we can make no matter what. And uh, yeah, how, how sad for the people who aren't willing to make them. Yeah. Yeah. So you, were you always of this, um, mindset or did you cultivate this was there a piece of it that you ended up cultivating more as you went through this journey because I I find I mean I certainly know for me that I am not the same person that I was before my son's substance abuse issues however there were clearly parts of that that I drew on parts of the good stuff there that I drew on to kind of create this other mindset but it wasn't like I was like you know Oh, I got this. There was a lot of, oh, holy hell, what am I going to do? Right. You know, so did you, did you create this mindset? How did the, how did that happen? So I do believe I was born a joy addict. You know, I just have that happy personality. I'm a bright side. I'm a, I love, the glass is always half full, at least, you know, and which I'm wrong some of the times and I'm also okay with being wrong, but I do believe I'm a, a, I'm a learner. I like to learn. And so, you know, I I had that perspective experience with cancer over 10 years ago. I was in a grocery store and I've told this story many times on stages and in my podcast, but I was standing there in the, you know, 10 items or less checkout lane in a hurry. And there was an uh, 850 year old woman in front of me paying for her 9,000 items with a check. Yeah, and I was like, oh, kill me, right? So I just, and it was, I was exploding in here. I would, I would never say anything to the older woman, but in here I was exploding. And then I looked next door and there was this really cute little shiny snow white dress on about a four or five year old little girl with no hair. And I thought, well, son oh. of a gun, that poor little thing, what she must be going through and this stupid line, I'm sitting here having a bad day over this stupid line. So I committed at that point, um, I would never, never, uh, be miserable over something less than cancer. So, you know, I, I, my mantra became, it's not cancer. So the car, I could get in the car accident and the tire could pop and whatever could hit the fan. And I just would say, it's not cancer. And then it was cancer. And oh. I, I could have chosen to be miserable. I could have, everyone would have uh, expected it. I could have taken a year and a half off of work. Everyone would have understood, but not me, you know? So instantly that mindset kicked in. I was like, well, I'm not a kid with cancer. It's not my kid with cancer. So, you know, I think once you are ingrained with things could always be worse, you are always appreciative of where you are. So it's something that was a process that you continually worked at. And this is something that Kristen and I say to people all the time. You don't get brilliantly resilient. No. 
you don't get there. Like it, you don't arrive there. You can have, you can have experiences of that. <laughs> Kristen, Kristen's laughing because like we go through this all the time, you know, ah, and then we go, wait, we got to work the process again, you know, yeah. because something goes on and something happens. But the, the fact that you approach it that way is, is a very practical way to ingrain this in people's lives. And this is the stuff we try to tell them. You have to, it becomes a process that you yeah. work at and you continue yeah. to do that, I assume. I, I do. And you have to want it too. It's, uh, you know, I've got a couple of members of my family who enjoy the fret. They want to worry. Mm. I'm worried about this. I'm worried. Well, yeah. what, what the hell does worry out? I love that. Enjoy worry. the fret. <laughs> Stop already. I mean, if you want to go be miserable, against it because life is short so some people like the drama some people like the fret they like to be engaged and crisis i do not i like sunny skies and even when a storm comes through florida man i love the sound of the rain hitting my roof and i love the wind in my face so there's always a bright side and you know i do sound like pollyanna but I, I make my choices and life is hard i get it life is really hard and and i slept on dozens of hotel bathroom floors, you know, mm -hmm. sick. And why, hey, why do we do that? Why do we sleep on the bathroom floor when we're sick? It's a stupid thing. But <laughs> I did, I was there, I was bald and gray and on the floor alone in a hotel bathroom. But when my alarm went off in the morning, I <laughs> figured out a way to put on my clothes, get dressed and go stand on those stages. And the second I got onto those stages, it was like someone flipped my on switch and all the horrible things I was experienced kind of faded away because I had this passion and I had these people and I could focus on them. And, you know, for what, whatever time I was on those stages announcing races, I got to be full force Fitz Kohler again. And I tell you what, ain't nothing better. She is awesome. And so I went from this kind of pathetic cancer patient, sickly girl to queen of the universe for at least eight hours or whatever. And, you know, that's the other things. It really helps to have a passion. So for me, my passion, my career and my kids, those are the things that fuel me. I also love animals. So whatever you're going through, you have to include your passions and maybe, maybe you love soccer and maybe if you can't play it, maybe you can watch it on TV. TV if you love animals and you're no longer at home or near the farm, maybe you're in the hospital, fine. Get cute little animal videos on YouTube and watch them. I mean, there's, there's just a way to include your passions in your world. And no matter what's going on, if you do that, you're, you'll uplift yourself, distract yourself in a positive way. I, I think that matters a lot. You're singing my song, girl. That's exactly what I did. So to be very brief, I was, I was always the, the big optimist. I made all of my choices. I had my life planned, right? And now I got into this horrific marriage, right? Mm -hmm. That went on too long and took every single piece of who I was out of who I was, right? Yeah. So when I was on my comeback, started four years ago when he finally left and, and stayed out, I actually had an attorney say to me, as I was trying to protect my kids, he said, Kristen, you need to advocate for yourself the way you advocate for your kids. Be one of your kids in your mind. And I thought, oh my gosh. And as I was unpacking that, trying to get back to myself and be my own big cheerleader and do my comeback, I went back to what is the happiest I've ever been where I was all me. And it was 10 years old on a soccer field. Yeah, so day, I will do about four or five days a week at the hockey rink, the roller hockey rink in my Love neighborhood. It. I'll kick the ball around just to get, keep myself in the, in the zone of what makes me me. Yeah, that matters. That's brilliant. What do you do, Mary Fran? You know, it's funny. I, I was, um, uh, I, I used to sing, I sang professionally. I'm mostly church stuff and all Impressive. that, but I was on stages a lot when I was a kid, I was a performer so I don't do that per se anymore, but this kind of thing feeds me yeah. because it's always about, it was always about to me somehow reaching people here, like in the heart. And, and, and at the time when I was younger, it was, it was through singing and it was through, you know, acting and telling others, you know, telling stories. Yeah. And this is that kind of thing for me now. So I, I really love that you're telling people you have to find ways to feed yourself. 
Got to You got to do it. And all the adults, you know, it's interesting from my fitness side of life where people are like, well, I don't have time to exercise. I have kids. Okay. No, let's, let's flip that. You have kids and I'm guessing you would like to see them graduate high school, get married, have grandkids. You have to take care of yourself. If you want to and have enough energy to keep up with your kid and give them everything they deserve in life, you have to take care of you. So it really is a mindset and I matter. I'm important in this family too. I do all sorts of things to make sure my kids are happy and healthy and engaged and learning. And then there's me and, you know, my mommy, (laughs) she lives five hours South of me in Fort Lauderdale. So I have to do those things for me and I, and I deserve a massage sometimes and I deserve a, a long bath and I deserve time at the gym. And I don't feel like I'm a selfish jerk for any of those things. I think I'm giving them what they deserve as well. Yeah, I love the benefits of it. Once I was healthy, back to my my old self, my kids were like, our lives completely took off. And they now go and seek things if they need to, you know, talk to a therapist, if they need to get out and go for a run. They look for those ways to manage their own health too. Leading by example. I think that's very important. And there is that, that physiological connection, you know, you, you have to take care of this physical sort of container that we're all in in order to make anything up here work or matter, because if the body isn't healthy, I mean, we've all had those days. We've had those, those sluggish, oh my God days, but, but you know what I find, and, and I'll be the first one to admit I never kicked a soccer ball on a soccer field. Nope. Didn't do it. Nope. Nope. And probably not ever going to do it except to play with kids. Right. But, but even that, you know, find that way to get up and be active when I'm tired, the best, the best solution. Occasionally it's a nap, but most of the time it's to get up and move and I'm not an athlete. So if I can commit to that and say that, then there is clearly something in your message. Absolutely. Absolutely. I I teach, uh, I do a lot of corporate presentations and one of my most popular speeches or presentations is called fixing your life with fitness. And, you know, fitness isn't just about looking great in your jeans or a swimsuit, you know, it's about being resilient and pain free because pain, people in pain are not always the most delightful people. They're not productive. They're lacking energy, you know, so having a healthy body allows you to be a more delightful spouse and parent and a more energetic, productive human being. You're better at work. You're uh, everything in your world, your attitude's better. Your level of stress is um, less. So fitness really does go a long way. And I do find people that are engaged in some sort of physical activity, whether it's yoga or karate or running, they're, they're happier, more well-adjusted, productive people. Awesome. Well, speaking on the fitness thing, I can't believe we have to actually wrap this up already. No! <laughs> what um, is Philly doing? We're Philly girls. Are they doing the marathon this year? Or is it? I hope so. Do you know that I announced the Philadelphia marathon last time we had it? I saw that on your website. I was like, oh my gosh, this girl's had a some Philly experience. Here. I did. And man, so my favorite thing is my country. I'm a raging patriot. And the AACR, which is the American Association of Cancer Research, they are the title sponsor of Philadelphia. And so they reached out. They wanted someone to bring more energy to the start line. But they also, you know, the fact that I was the big deal uh, race announcer with cancer helped. And when they invited me, I couldn't have been more excited because uh, I just the history there is so magical. And I had never been. Oh, really? I got to see the Liberty Bell and I, yeah, I mean, it was, it was such a cool thrilling. City. Yeah. So no, I, I love it. So hopefully it'll be on because I have I'm friends hoping. that run in it. Oh, you'll love this too. So my soccer team from high school, when I was going through my whole big mess that started four years ago, we started a group text. Everybody got back together. And then we would, there was a period of time where they were doing Saturday morning conference calls with me to help me stay on track and not completely lose it. And we still do our group text. We play soccer once a year Aww. and help each other through. We did Zoom calls all through COVID and all of that. It's, um, I just, I, I guess I'm just a team and tribe kind of person that I'm fueled by. Yeah, and they, yeah. some of them run in the marathon. So maybe people will give me a Mary Fran out. Well, I, I was, just, I just want to bring this conversation. Just, just, can we just tone it down a little bit? For those of us <laughs> no, to- we cannot, sorry. <laughs> Ain't happening. <laughs> hey, listen, there's For those a of us who are, who are not about to go out and run a marathon. Where do we start? Okay. Well, that's it. You start at the start. You just get okay. out, you walk down your block and you walk back and the next day you do a little more and the next day you do a little more. So when it comes to the racing world, quite often there's a one miler, which is 
pretty short. Very yeah, I can do that. I am a big walker Listen, and I, I mean, I just don't do the whole running thing. My, I do pa my policy, if you can roam through the mall for one hour, you can do a 5k. <laughs> it's only three miles and it's yeah. only, maybe it's a big deal for you at the time, but three miles, 3.1 is something very attainable. I think I average could do jet. That. Of course you could. Then there's mm -hmm. the 10k half and full. So start out a one mile or start at a 5k and go out with no pressure to finish in any sort of time, no pressure to run, just get a friend walking and the running community, the running community, really, instead of looking like those skinny folks in the uh, shorty shorts and the, you know, high top sneakers or whatever, the running community is now anyone you would see at Walmart at 3 a.m. I tell you what, <laughs> I've got 400 pounders crossing the finish line of a marathon, 90 year olds doing marathons. I've got every person, every walk of life. I have people with zero legs finishing my races. So um, there's something for everybody. And I, I assure you, if you come out once, you're likely to come out again. It's fun. It's addicting. It's, yeah. It's so fun, so, yeah. especially with somebody like you that you're going to start and finish with. That's yeah. right. You can come and do all of my races all around the country. I wouldn't mind. <laughs> so I want to know, um, and I want everybody to know where we can find you, where we can find your book, where we can get, where we can get more fits. Thank you. So <laughs> my brand is Fitness. It's F-I-T-Z-N-E-S-S. -S. So fitness.com is my home base. There you can find all the articles, recipes, videos, uh, the media information about me, book sales are there. I'm also at fitness on most social media channels. So uh, specifically Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, go to at fitness and I've got a wealth of information. I post some fun stuff and don't just follow me, engage with me, say hi, say I listen to you on the brilliantly, brilliantly, you like that? <laughs> Brilliantly <laughs> resilient podcast because um, I love I love to make new friends. And then as far as the book goes, so here's the deal with the book: it's available in hardback, um, paperback, ebook, and audiobook. So all four types, awesome. and it's available everywhere books are sold: Amazon, Audible, KDP, blah blah blah. However, if you come to fitness.com for at least your print books, every book that leaves my um, person is signed so you can say inscribe it to this person and then oh. all of those books come with this um sticker it says i can do hard things and that was my mantra while i was going through it because i i'm actually as tough as i am i used to be a competitive kickboxer i am a super medical wimp so you know as i would face these new obstacles needles scans surgeries i would remind myself inside i didn't realize i was saying it at first but i was telling myself, you can do hard things, you can do hard things. And I, I was going through the list. I've raised great kids. I've built a great business. I can do hard things. And so I said it enough that eventually got me to the finish line. So, you know, the books that come out of fitness.com, they're signed, they come with a gift. And um, apparently they're making a, a big splash as a gift for cancer patients and survivors and caregivers. Oh, wow. so okay. That really makes me happy that I'm able to help other people through their nightmare and help it be a little more um, positive and productive. So yeah, and and, and I, I'm excited to see meet your listeners. So thank you for asking. Well, we really, I mean, this was, this was a delightful conversation. I'm glad I amped up and put my animal prints on because you know, <laughs> you're fierce. You're fierce and we, um, this, was, this was wonderful. Um, thank you so much for joining us and want everybody to go and get the book at your site and get a signature on it. That's cool. That's right. Yeah, Thank good you. stuff. Thanks so much for, for joining us and, and reviving this tribe to really keep us on this, having our most brilliant year yet. I mean, the strategies that you talked about, your energy level and this whole, I have it stuck in my head now. I can do hard things. It's a great mantra to go into the sucker punches with and then go through the brilliant, the resilient process. So thanks so much, Fitz. And we'll, we'll see you on all the social channels. And then we'll have to hook up when we find out when the uh, Philly Marathon's going again. I'll we'll be there. At the start line. All right, everybody, get all the other resources that you need to reset, rise, and reveal your brilliance at our website, brilliantlyresilient.net. We'll see you next time.